Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on addressing technical challenges of European Federation of Data Innovation Hubs uh, on the example of the EU Hubs for Data project. Uh, my name is Natalie Chernetska, and I'm Head of Business Development of TerraLab IMT. Uh, and if you tweet, you can tweet using my, my hashtag, and also you can tweet the, using the hashtag EUHubs for data. You're obviously welcome to tweet. Let's start about some housekeeping rules, some bit of netiquette. So all participants, except speakers and moderators, are muted by default. And also, when you're not speaking, please turn off your video to send save bandwidth. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you can post them in your application Q&A box. And if you would like to speak, you can raise your hand and wait for me to give you the floor. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please contact the Zoom host. And also, I will add that if by any chance someone or we all disconnect we are going just calmly reconnect now let's um, let's um, explain the agenda of this session um, so we are going now through the introduction i will then introduce the speakers and the eu hubs for data project then we are going to through overview of the technical challenges and deep dive on specific challenges. We will conclude with some lessons learned and future actions, and then we're going to have Q&A and conclusions. And I'm very, very happy to have uh, the speakers, which I'm going to introduce to you in the order they're going to appear. We are having Andrea Manzi, who is Data Solution Manager at AG Foundation in Netherlands. We are going to have Ricardo Simon Carbajo, who is head of innovation and development in CEDAR in Ireland. Roberta Turra, head of data analytics team at Cineca in Italy. Martin Plotienik, head of IT system department at PSNC in Poznan, Poland. Paola Peña, big data and cognitive system researcher and project manager Ita Nova in Zaragoza, DH Aragon. And Jordi Arjoka-Roca, Distributed System Group Coordinator in ITI in Valencia, Spain. So um, I will start with very brief introduction of the project, EU Hub for Data, EU Hubs for Data project, which started in September. And it's a project of 40 months and coordinated by ITI in Valencia, Spain. It's a very diverse project. We have 21 institutions from 12 countries. And what are we trying to achieve? We are building a federation of data-driven data in digital innovation hubs. Digital innovation hubs starting with the hubs which are already partners of the project and then expanding, expanding towards um, other regions and other digital innovation hubs. And so at the center of this federation is a federated catalog, federated catalog of services, data sets, and training offers. And actually, although the project started only in September, we already produced uh, the first version of, of this catalog, which is obviously going to be updated and improved. And while building this, work, this catalog, and also while working on other dimensions of the project, obviously there is a European dimension, there is a regional dimension, there is an offer side, there is a demand side, we are facing multiple challenges. Business challenges, governance challenges, legal challenges, and obviously multiple technical challenges. This session is dedicated to technical challenges of this project, how we are facing them, how we are solving them, what are the lessons learned. And I am giving now the floor uh, to my colleague, Andrea Manzi from AG Foundation, who is going to give an overview of those challenges. So Andrea, the floor is yours. The mic is screen are yours. Okay. I think you need to stop sharing. Okay, <laughs> thanks. 
I think you need to stop sharing, otherwise. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so uh, good afternoon everyone, Andre Manzi from the AGI Foundation. So I'm going to give uh, an overview of the technical challenges we have for the data project. And uh, basically, of course, uh, we will go in details with the follow the presentation of my colleagues, uh, the next presentation of my colleagues. So at the end, I wanted to give mainly here a description of what have the, 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 the initial project and the federated catalog that has been um, developed so far and then some aspects of the technical challenging and I will spend more time on some of them that maybe will be not described uh, by my colleagues uh, later on during the during the session and then of course uh, after you know all the other presentation from my colleagues I will uh, include uh, some uh, I will end uh, you know the session with some lesson and the next steps given that the project you know it's uh, started not uh, not so long ago so we have like uh, a lot of uh, um, years you know two, two more years you know to and the other activities to 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 complete the project and um we so as i said before the project is uh the works for the project uh, aims at uh, building a federation of uh, digital innovation apps we have 12 digital innovation apps that are part of the uh, member of the project and we are going to extend the, the membership to 18 more that we're going to uh, be selected via two open calls. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, also running now. And uh, of course, on all of them, all of the DHs have they have they, their own uh, uh, catalog of services, data sets, and training courses. So uh, we have quite a big heterogeneous offer coming from the from the different DHs. And um, one of the uh, aim of the project is to uh, federate the offer. So as I said before, by Natalie, so the data set services and uh, also the trainings, which will uh, will also be federated uh, at the European level and. Um, uh, with the aim of, uh, you know, uh, instantiating then uh, the, 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 this federated catalog at regional level, meaning that uh, uh, local SMEs or startups at regional level will have the possibility to, uh, of course, provide um, uh, access uh, services uh, coming from reg regional DHs, but also uh, uh, extend the, the possibility to uh, access the, the services and data sets that are coming from the other DH at the European level. The, the catalog that uh, we has been built uh, at the beginning of the project uh, was released uh, after three months uh, mm -hmm. at, the, uh, at the end of November because uh, it has to be ready for the it has to be ready for the uh, first project open call that was uh, uh, planned for December 2020. And of course, uh, with this has been published on the project website, both for the services and both the catalog of services and the catalog of data sets. And uh, we have been working uh, for definition of the catalog entries for both the services and the data sets. So preparing you know, the, the, the templates for both of them and do the categorization. And of course, uh, uh, preparing and trying to identify, you know, in the, uh, the DH network part of the project, uh, the, the assets to, to include, and also uh, extending this to a high value value data sets coming from the European repositories. And uh, the first version uh, that is available on our website now is containing 74 services. Uh, we include also in the category of services also access to private data sets that are coming from the ages. And then uh, we have also 79 data sources in total, uh, more than 11,000 public data sets that uh, are uh, you know, linked from our website. And the um, particular as I said before, the catalog uh, is being used by SMEs that uh, participated into the first project open call. They, of course, selected uh, services and data, data sets that uh, uh, belong, belong to the catalog, and uh, two more open calls are planned during the project. Uh, the first uh, experiments has just started, so in May, uh, and uh, the, one of the art requirements for those um, experiments has, has been to uh, select services coming from uh, at least two different DHs. This, of course, um, will be important, and, uh, and this is one of the prerequisites because, of course, we want to uh, um, uh, implement uh, interoperability and data sharing between the different services of the DHs, uh, one of the uh, 
goal and one of the purpose of the uh, uh, experiments is also to uh, test, of course, the interoperability between the, the services that are coming from different DIHs. Um, uh, one of the uh, characteristic of the experiments is that uh, they will bring also data sets uh, and also during the experiments execution, they will produce data sets that might be integrated in the catalog if possible. So now I'm going to go through the technical challenges and also activity related to technical challenges. Uh, so just to mention that uh, the work packages that um, um, we describe today, the activity today, so mainly work package four, which is the related to toolkit for federated services, work package five, which is the federation of data source and data sets. We also described the challenge related to the management plans, which is coming from the work package 10. Uh, we are not going to describe today the activities related to training skills that has been uh, before this session and other uh, session related to data skills in Europe and the apps for data. Um, so starting from the data sets point of view, so of course, uh, one of the big challenges in your apps for data, it's uh, you know the uh, harmonization and identification of the data set offering coming from the different uh, DH network and also from uh, uh, third party repositories. So the one of the uh, uh, main activities, uh, implementation of workflows for uh, pushing your data set to the catalog and uh, performing automatic uh, pre-analysis together with the uh, metadata enrichment, which will be described later on um, uh, as, uh, during the session. And of course, another uh, important aspect is the metadata harmonization of the data sets based on and the classification based on uh, ontologies, which we also will also we'll describe in detail uh, during the during the session. Um, as I said, you know, uh, the offering is not only data sets, but also services. So part of the, um, the, the catalog uh, um, and delivery framework of the services is also a, a quite uh, important challenge for the project. Uh, first of all, you know, defin defining the category of services, the granularity and the description, which, you know, we started uh, as uh, part of the activity that uh, been delivered during the, the first version of the, for the first version of the catalog. But of course, uh, activities related to uh, definition of the architecture of the catalog, like uh, you know, centralized or distributed, and the definition of the processes for uh, the onboarding of the services for the ordering or the building is also uh, quite important. That will be also be described today, and of, and we try of to follow closely the concept of architecture that uh, coming from um, leading uh, European initiative like IAX. Um, another important aspect that uh, we're going to, that is of course needed in the, when building, you know, the federation of uh, DIHs uh, uh, is the interoperability and data sharing, because of course, we don't want to deliver only a catalog of, uh, uh, like a common catalog of assets, but we, the idea for the federation, for the future federation is to have uh, um, interoperability between the services that are a part of it. And uh, of course, having also a um, uh, trusted uh, data exchange environment. Uh, AIDSA, so the International Space Association is part of, uh, is a member of the project that is leading the activities related to service and data interoperability. So uh, we adopted the IDS model for the, since the beginning of the project. Um, the activities uh, related to interoperability and data sharing is uh, also uh, coordinated, uh, coordinated by the International Data Space, but also with, uh, with the effort of uh, TNO. And uh, both TNO and International Data Space Association, uh, we have organized a series of workshops uh, since the beginning of the project in order to introduce the reference data model of IDS, the connector concept, and uh, to define you know, the stories between the services that are uh, part of the the ages and um, this particular uh, um, and uh, of course in order to implement and define uh, the, the ideas connector uh, we uh, we define uh, development sprints uh, in the project uh, fo they are focused mainly on two activities and uh, uh, just storage clusters the user stories uh, clusters so the access to data sets and uh, exposing of the dih services uh, starting from uh, one of the open source connector that has been developed by um, by the Fraunhofer. Um, but of course, we are develop we are evaluating also other connectors that uh, will enable you know data sharing. For instance, the public data space connector for open data and the enterprise inter integration connector. Uh, TNO, as I said before, is uh, uh, is also uh, the 
responsible for the, for the technical activities uh, uh, and will is providing uh, the trust environments or components of uh, the ideas, the ideas uh, uh, architecture like the certification authorities and the DAPs and uh, some components uh, related to discoverability like the metadata broker. Um, we are going to have tomorrow another session related to this, the Office for Data Connector Party. Basically, this is organized also by the, the International Space Association at TNO which uh, basically will introduce the federation uh, of connector that uh, the federation of for data and the connector that uh, we are developing and there will be also an hands on session in order to uh, deploy connectors and perform data sharing uh, in the environment uh, that uh, we, are, we are setting up uh, as i said before the um, challenges also uh, the level of data management in particular for the definition of the data management plan in this heterogeneous uh, uh, environment uh, uh, Important, of course, is the definition of the categories of data that and how they will be treated. So, because we have, like, of course, data sets that are coming from the project that belonging to uh, members of the consortium, uh, and that will be uh, including the catalog, both public and uh, private data sets, data that is originating from the experiments uh, that are related to open calls. And, of course, in this case, we have we will have, we'll have to uh, define also the fair strategy for the for the for this particular uh, category of data sets. Um, and another part particular aspect that is important is related to data security and, uh, and uh, also ethical aspect. Uh, we also in the project, we have an ethics monitoring group that is uh, you know, coordinating all the aspects related to, to, to ethics. And uh, also this part will be uh, uh, described in detail in the next uh, presentation. And um, one aspect that uh, maybe we don't uh, uh, describe today in, the, in detail, but uh, it's important is, of course, the, all the activities related to data privacy and protection, which uh, basically uh, will uh, um, result in providing guidelines for data management for the uh, DIHs and the, pro and the project participants, um, of course, focusing mainly on the, uh, in particular, on the catalog for data sets. Uh, this particular part of the, um, of the activities of the project uh, uh, dealt so far with the categorization of uh, data set from the privacy and personal data prote protection perspective. Uh, the definition of the roles uh, of the participant in the project under the GDPR. And uh, given, you know, uh, that we are Produce and bringing all the catalog uh, to the catalog data sets that are coming from the party definition of the disclaimers for this particular category of data sets. And um, of course, uh, together, the, the guidelines, we had the first version of the guidelines that have been released this uh, in February, and uh, you know, it will be further developed during the, the project lifetime. And together with the guidance, there have been also the development of a checklist that uh, intended to provide uh, the member of the federation. Um, uh, kind of uh, short recap on the privacy related aspect that uh, should be taken into account. In particular, this is important for the providers of data uh, because, of course, they have to, uh, you know, this is important when, you know, they uh, need to uh, prov include the new data set in the catalog. Um, I think this concludes uh, this first uh, overview of the um, technical challenges. Uh, this part of the lesson learned and next steps, uh, I said, uh, is going to we're going to um, uh, give at the end of the of the session. Um, so I think that uh, I will give the floor to Natalie to introduce the next uh, speakers. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this overview of challenges. And you have seen they're really multiple from interoperability to data privacy and security. And now, if you have questions, Andrea, and also for the next six speakers, please enter them in, uh, in your app's chat. There is a Q&A box, and then we'll take them at the end at the joint Q&A session. But now we are going to have a deep dive with focus on particular specific challenges. And I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Ricardo Simon Carvajal. So Ricardo, the microphone and the screen share. I hello, Natalie. Hello, everyone. And good afternoon. Let me share this thing here. OK. You can see this, right? Yes, we can see your screen. We just need it in the full. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So you can hear me okay. Okay, yes. perfect. 
So, um, yeah, it's great, you know, to be here with you today. Today, I'm going to focus on a particular aspect within the EU Hubs for Data project, which is the challenges in when we are trying to create the EU Hubs for Data dataset catalog, which is a strategic piece of work in the project. And particularly, the challenge is in identifying and do a pre-analysis of the data sources and data sets. So before um, continuing, I will say that you know I'm Ricardo Simon Carvajo, I'm the head of innovation and development in CIDAR, which is Ireland Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence. Uh, we work there in the innovation and development group in a different kind of projects, uh, creating prototypes, but mainly creating products for SMEs and multinational companies and in a variety of projects at national and European uh, level. I will, because the EU has four data projects, it's all about the IHs. Uh, we are the one in, in Ireland, we are Ireland's Digital Innovation Hub in AI. So I will briefly mention how we work so you understand what a DIH is if you don't know about this. But basically, uh, CIDAR as a DIH, it is funded by the government, okay, because the government in Ireland needed to support SMEs and multinational companies with uh, uh, AI and data analytics. So they created uh, CIDAR around seven years ago or so. And we were based in two universities, three universities, University College Dublin and Technical you know, Technological University of Dublin, the two main large ones, large universities. And even though we are based there in these two universities, everything we do is for, for industry. We are there, we have, do apply research, we are in touch with universities, like many other digital innovation hubs, but the focus is on help is helping SMEs and, and multinational companies in, in Ireland and in Europe. So far, we have created this membership uh, company group. We have more than 93 member companies at the moment. As you can see there on the right hand side, different type of companies from top multinationals to startup in different verticals there. So we serve a large variety of, of industries. And then we have developed these sort of prototypes. Uh, we have, I think, 67 at the moment, uh, which we develop every six months. And basically, we listen to the challenges in industry. And then we act and develop in these prototypes over six months. So that's how we help as a DIH the ecosystem. As that's our ethos, right? So we have been recognized by being included in the AI DIH network here, right? Top 30 DIHs in Europe. And mainly, we have been involved a lot with the Big Data Value Association. And we have, we've been granted recently, actually, the PDBA iSpace uh, Gold Accreditation or Level, which is basically very much linked to the concept of the DIH and obviously very much in line with the EU Has for Data project. Um, so having said that, CIDAR uh, and the connection between CIDAR and EU Has for Data is because we are one of the 12 DIHs, as, as uh, Andres, what Andrea was mentioning, one of the 12 DIHs in big data and AI. And together with the other ones, we are developing these strategic pieces to actually a better collaborate, create that network of DIHs and expand, right? So we are focusing on, on services, how to identify the key services, how to compose them and all of that. I'm not going to go into that. Talking about, you know, how to do training together, right? And the thing I'm going to touch on today is about creating that EU has for data, uh, data set catalog, which is, is going to be key for all of us and for the SMEs. So the idea is that we build this European catalog of data sets, but the focus of this catalog is to catalyze the adoption of big data and AI in industry. So this catalog, it cannot be like any other catalog. The focus there is more, you know, on helping SMEs to use data sets to apply AI, to apply big data solution, and then grow and be more competitive at international levels. So we are not trying to reinvent the wheel with this catalog. We are trying to create a new data economy as well there for benefiting industry. So what I'm saying we are not trying to reinvent the wheel is because there's a lot of data sets catalogs. Uh, one of them that you probably will know of you is the, the European Data Open Data Portal. Now it has been it has been superseded by the data Europe.eu, the data.europa.eu, which is basically the same, okay? But now it's the official portal for European data. There's I think you know 1.3 million uh, data sets there, lots of catalogs in different languages, right? In this portal. And uh, one of the beauties of this, uh, this portal is that they have adopted the data catalog vocabulary. So this is one of the key challenges that we have with this. We really need to be consistent in the metadata and the, the standards and the vocabularies that we use. 
because we have observed when we work with different SMEs, when we try to get open data from different sources, it is a mess, okay? Uh, either, you know, the metadata is not there or it follows different standards and the harmonization is, is one of the trickiest parts. So we are leveraging exist existing catalogs like the data that you have you. Uh, there are way many, okay? But the difference between what uh, EU has for data catalog does and the rest is that we are trying to bring the open data, that is where data.europe.eu specializes in, particularly public data sets, but also the non-open data. Okay, those data sets that are created by SMEs or the DIHs or other actors there that have a lot of value, but still can actually be utilized and leveraged by other SMEs to create further data sets. And that is the beauty of the EU has for data. We are creating this catalog to benefit SMEs uh, and then just to create this, this kind of sharing of data set and a new data economy there. And one of the main things here is that the, how do we identify these data sources and data sets? So these, these are huge you know, list of sources. Even when we go into the European data portal, um, it is very tricky. I mean, this is, is categorized there, but still it's open data. And, and still some, some of the data sets that don't have the same quality as others, right? So we really need to act uh, for the EU has for data catalog as, as a filter as well, you know, to, to, to select the real data sets that have the most value for, for the SMEs and the, and the multinational companies as well. So rather than just hosting data sets in the EU has for data catalog, what we have decided is that we act as the uh, provider of these links and these descriptions of the data sets and the data sources. So we don't host the data set itself. Everyone or different providers manage their own data sets, and that has to be like that for many issues, right? As well, because it's not only open data sets, it's also uh, non open data sets. There are ethical issues, there are other things with sharing, right? But then we need to be aware of what is happening with these data, data sets. We need to be alert, you know, we need to identify all of them and, and, and be up to date on those ones. So for the identification of more data sets, at the moment, all of these portals rely on people just to know the portal and upload it, right? So that's what we call, you know, push mechanisms. There's push mechanisms and then pull mechanisms. So push mechanisms, we rely on parties like data providers, like for example, us, like the Innovation Hubs, or SMEs or any other party which has data to actually provide the link, provide the metadata to our portal. Okay. Then we are exploring different channels, and that's there are different technical issues there. Do we go with the portal? Is it a decentralized approach? Do we use connectors for that? What sort of access do we give you know, to the data providers? Uh, what sort of users are we are we are we allowing to participate? Because as I said, the data sets have to be quality data sets and for SMEs. So there are multiple channels there that we are working uh, in at the project level. But one of the key things there, if we are creating this catalog, at the end of the day, the key aspect is just the engagement of all of these data providers. If we don't have a strategy to engage them, so they have a benefit in uploading these data sets or you know, the, the, the description of these data sets to our catalog, there's not gonna be uh, an organic grow, growth of the catalog. So we're working on, on, on engagement strategies to actually bring the value for these data providers to provide both open data sets, maybe you know, for visibility and also non-open data. And that's when you know, the data economy kind of strategies start. So what is the benefit for me and how am I protected when I provide this data, okay? So that's the push mechanism. And then the pull mechanism is when we go as a DIH and try to identify more catalogs and leverage different information in catalogs to actually identify other data sources. Typically, that's open data, but we're also trying to uh, expand that to non to discover non-open data. And we use SparkQL as a new query language there to, to query these catalogs specifically, and then crawling techniques that we are developing just to, to improve on, on the identification of, of new catalogs that can be brought here. Okay. And once we have the identify all of these data sources mainly, we are we're going to the analysis of these data sources, right? And the problem is the quality of the metadata, it's always the same. How do we harmonize this? Is it really complete? Many of the data sets are not, right? Many of the metadata. Standards, they are different. So we are going, we're trying to go into the DKET too, okay? So enforce that, but that's not, that's not that easy. So what we're doing is just, we are developing automatic uh, analysis tools, okay, or scripts for a few things. One of them is metadata augmentation. So if we are provided with the type, the format, the license, but we are missing other parameters there, other fields, 
we just go, we use SparkQL, we just scraping our instruction in different websites to actually augment and complete that metadata. Scraping whenever it's possible, okay? Also, we use these um, automatic analysis tools that we're developing to align to standards when possible. So uh, it could be that there's in different standards, but we need to correlate them to the same one, okay? And I agree on that. And sometimes we have to enforce the minimum set of the metadata. We cannot just go with the full vocabulary because not everyone completes that, okay? But as long as we have a minimum uh, set of metadata, uh, which is consistent, which corresponds to the standard, there will be a lot of interaction and just uh, a lot of use, usability of the data set and uh, suggestions and recommendations and, and, and combination of data sets, okay? In a very automatic way. Another thing that we do is just we periodically verify whether the, the data set at the source uh, still exists uh, is it still accessible? The version has changed or, or what has happened? Because that's very important as well. It's more a dynamic, you know, um, dynamic check, you know, of the data sets. We cannot expect, you know, to use only static data sets as well, you know, dynamic data sets. We need to be uh, aggregating the catalog and know what happens with them, with them. And also, finally, we highlight as well potentials. We need to highlight potentials in the, in the inclusion of the data sets, for example, that cannot be taken, cannot be processed automatically because it requires a human in the loop approach for inspection, for curation, for, for example, for approval, if, if there needs to be an ethical approval, for, for example. Okay. So finally, this is how the data search catalog looks at the moment in the EU has for data portal. As you can see, there are different filters, different fields in the metadata, license type, the domain, metadata available or not, publicly accessible or not coverage as well, the country, Europe, and the format, which there are plenty. That's another another technical challenge, you know. At uh, the 79, but it's growing. One of the beauties of this is just this has these data sets and these catalogs have been selected by us, but also have been provided by the DAHs in the consortium. So as we expand um, in the US for data, we'll have more DAHs, there will be more wisdom, more data sets that will be brought into the catalog. And these data sets have the particularity that they are known by the DIHs involved in the, in the consortium. And at the end of the day, when the SMEs come and just have a look at these data sets, they usually like you know, to partner with DIHs to, to help leverage these, these data sets. So because we know these data sets, we have the domain knowledge, and this is quality data sets, and that's why we are recommending them. And it will be very beneficial for the SMEs. OK, so thank you very much. Uh, and I suppose questions later. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for this thorough presentation of the challenges related to building data set catalog. And obviously, if you have questions for Ricardo, uh, you can put them in Q and box. And you're obviously welcome to consult the catalog. The first version of the catalog is already online. And now from um, approaching collection data sets, the classification and the analysis, we are moving to data management. And I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Roberta Tura. So Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. I will try to share my screen. Okay. So uh, I'm Roberta Tura. I'm going to present you the challenges that we faced uh, in uh, uh, making the data management plan in the project AWABS for data. Uh, first of all, what is a data management plan? It is a document that is required by the European Commission to, in order to describe the data management life cycle for the data to be collected, processed, generated, by a project in order to make those data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. In the meantime, ensuring compliance to the GDPR and to the ethics requirements. Usually, it is a living document that is updated throughout the project duration. In AOABS for Data, the first version has been released at month six and will be further developed at month 21 and 36. But why do we need a data management plan? We need it in order to support a data life cycle in every single step. We need it in order to define the procedures starting from the collection of data, 
going through the processing of data, which encompasses cleaning data, anonymizing data if necessary, and preparing data for the analysis. And after the analysis step, when the results are produced, instead of getting rid to the data, uh, there should be a preservation step where uh, the metadata are defined and the documentation is uh, provided in order to make those data uh, ready to be used again. And in order to reuse those data, uh, a access must be provided, uh, so um, access policies and sharing policies must be defined, and this enables uh, the uh, reusage and uh, the cycle can start again with the processing analysis and so on. So uh, this because uh, all uh, uh, publicly funded research project uh, produce data and these data are an asset and shouldn't be wasted. So how uh, did we um, face this uh, um, problem of making the data management planning EOPS for data. Uh, the problem in this case is that uh, we are 12 uh, data center, 12 uh, digital innovation um, hubs, each one with its own procedures, its own policies. And uh, we have a common catalog of data set that uh, it's been, has been presented before, but uh, uh, at the month six, when the first version of the data management plan had to be had to be uh, released, we didn't have any knowledge of the data that uh, uh, will be actually used inside the, inside the project. So um, we didn't have the knowledge of the data that uh, are going to be treated in the project, and uh, we didn't know uh, which uh, proceed the we didn't have a unified procedure to treat them. So uh, how, do, how did we approach this, uh, this problem? Uh, we decided to define data in a broad sense and uh, define categories of data and describe how data in each category will be treated. And we identified eight categories of data. As I said, uh, uh, data, we mean data in a broad sense, so not only structured data, but also unstructured data like presentations, videos, documents, uh, textual documents, uh, software, demos. Uh, um, so uh, the first uh, three categories are data that, that are provided by the consortium. The fourth and fifth category are data that are brought by the experiments, uh, be it uh, the input uh, data uh, to the experiment uh, or uh, the output that is generated, for, uh, uh, data generated by the project, uh, but mainly for internal use. So when we talk about the FAIR principle, the FAIR approach, uh, um, we don't take into consideration uh, uh, the internal document, but uh, uh, we mainly focus on uh, the uh, data brought by the experiments. So the categories four and fifth are the most interesting uh, uh, in order to make uh, data generated by the project uh, fair, findable, uh, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But the problem is that uh, at the month six, uh, uh, we didn't have any experiment uh, started yet. Uh, the, the open call uh, was not even open. Um, so what we did was to define general guidelines. And these are uh, the strategy uh, for making data findable. The main strategy is uh, to set up the catalog. And data set can be searched in this catalog using the metadata and filters. But in the next month, the metadata vocabulary standards will be adopted for that. How do we make the uh, data accessible? Uh, at the moment, uh, each uh, DIH has its own uh, access policies. Um, so data set are, uh, can be accessed through these uh, uh, policies data originated from the execution of the experiments uh, will not be made available unless uh, the data owner agrees to do so. 
regarding interoperability, uh, the two strategies we are pursuing are uh, the implementation of the IDS connectors uh, and the identification of common metadata structures in order to build ontologies. Regarding the reuse, the catalog of data set is actually promoting the reuse of existing data set and the beneficiaries of the open course will be encouraged to share their data through the catalog. Moreover, dissemination material will promote extensively these data sets as well as the services and the training programs in order to increase the data reuse. The data management plan has also a section relating to data security and a section on the ethical aspects. Uh, regarding the ethical aspects, we have an ethics monitoring group uh, that uh, uh, monitors any issue that can arise around uh, the usage of data. And uh, regarding data security, um, each uh, hosting DIH, uh, each uh, uh, data provider has uh, its uh, own uh, uh, security policy and uh, as data protection is a crucial aspect uh, in the data management, uh, a security, a data security map is going to be built uh, and it will be um, a detailed uh, uh, description of the technical and organizational security measures that are available among the different uh, DIHs in order to enable comparison among uh, uh, the different level of uh, security measures that we uh, can offer. Uh, what are the next steps for the next uh, release of uh, the data management plan? The DMP will be continuously updated to be kept in alignment with the catalogs evolution, the technical advancements and the deliverables being produced. The DIH data security map is going to be produced and as uh, at month eight, uh, the experiments uh, uh, were selected and uh, they are now starting their activities, it has been possible to do an assessment of the data that uh, are actually involved in each experiment. And this assessment has been done on the proposal uh, of the experiment, and this is a brief uh, summary of, of this assessment of the 10 projects uh, that have that uh, have been uh, funded and that are starting their activity now. Um, most of them is, uh, is going to use uh, as input uh, data set that come from third party or uh, data set from the catalog. None of them is going to use uh, its own data set. Uh, I mean, the, the SME data set of customers or production or their own data set. But mostly third party data set, they all are going to generate data set. And uh, most of them also declare that they are willing to share those data after the end of uh, the project. Um, and they will contribute to different uh, common European data space. Um, in, this, uh, in this schema, uh, also the, the DIH uh, that, is, that will um, most probably be responsible for the storage and the processing of data is indicated. Uh, each uh, DIH has different uh, procedures and policies and for this reason we decided that uh, each experiment uh, will have to document uh, the relevant data management aspect because they will be slightly different from DIH to DIH and uh, they have a template to do so, uh, which is this one. Um, so the DIH together with the SME uh, will uh, have to describe for each uh, data set involved in the experiment uh, to provide a description of the data set to describe which standards and metadata are used. What are the data sharing policies? Uh, is the data set, uh, is, is it going to be shared as a whole or only some part of it? What are the uh, target uh, users? Is there any fee to be paid and so on? And if uh, the data set cannot be shared, the reasons for this should be mentioned. They may be ethical reasons or uh, 
personal data are involved or intellectual property, commercial reasons, security related reasons or whatever. And finally, the archiving and preservation aspects uh, should be described uh, for how long data will be preserved, uh, what will be the uh, volume uh, of the data and uh, the costs for doing this uh, long-term long preservation. So uh, this is the roadmap of the activity. Uh, when the, the experiment start, uh, they can uh, uh, already describe uh, the input data set uh, and uh, if uh, there are personal data involved uh, the uh, necessary actions uh, will be taken in order to be sure to be compliant with the GDPR. During uh, the experiment uh, the sharing policies will be defined uh, so that at the end of the experiment uh, the output data set can be described with the template that I just uh, showed you and after the uh, end of the project, uh, uh, the implementation phase can start uh, to, to implement the sharing policies, uh, include the data set in the catalog and integrate it with uh, the other data asset. So uh, in conclusion, providing the first release of the DMP has been challenging. The experiments uh, will bring new challenges, but at least now we know which data are involved and the DIHs have some general guidelines on the main strategies and on the information to be collected in order to make this data fair. As we progress uh, towards a real federation, hopefully unified procedures will also be defined, so we will have a unique uh, uh, data management plan for all experiments. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the attention. I'm available for any question. Um. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roberta, for this uh, thorough presentation of uh, and re for reminding us how important data management is, obviously, for such projects as ours, because we are building a catalog of data sets, but also uh, for industrial experiments that are using data sets or uh, generating data sets. So if you have any questions, please put them in, in the box, um, in the Q&A box below. And meanwhile, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Martin uh, Plotinik, who is also going to um, speak about technical challenges of this project. Okay, uh, thank you, Natalie, for this invitation. I hope you can hear me and see the presentation. Yes, we do. Okay, uh, so I decided uh, to focus um, here on the challenges for the Federation that uh, maybe are not yet or will not be uh, fully solved in the side of uh, UHUBS for Data project, but uh, project will at least uh, build some, um, uh, provide some uh, building blocks. So. Uh, uh, my name again is Marcin Puchenik. I'm from Poznan Supercomputing Networking Center. And just to give you uh, uh, the, the, the background uh, and also of my perspective is, is uh, uh, PSNC is not only the uh, uh, R&D uh, laboratory, but uh, uh, is also um, basically Polish uh, uh, infrastructure provider. So in terms of data, uh, HPC, uh, uh, we are NREN, uh, also data repositories and digital libraries federation. Uh, and we are also cloud provider and we are part of many, many initiatives like uh, uh, the uh, BBA, uh, uh, Alliance of Internet Innovation, uh, EUDAT and several others and mainly also around uh, uh, the data. So uh, we are um, uh, in, uh, uh, Ricardo just presented another um, uh, DIH. We are uh, also representing this project, um, the, the, uh, the data focused uh, DIH uh, uh, that provides number of, of different uh, services in the region. And we are also one of the candidates for the EDIH. Uh, this is a very short uh, introduction of myself to, um, uh, to just to also to, to see the background uh, of, of, uh, of, of the challenges that I'm presenting. 
So basically, uh, I would like to have a look on the on the perspective from the perspective of four Bs of big data. So uh, volume, so scale of data, uh, varieties, so different forms of the data, velocity, so analysis of the data flow and veracity, uncertainty of the data. I think though all those four are uh, from uh, the data provider, a data center, very important aspects that. Uh, that that have uh, usually have challenges itself, uh, uh, but if you if you think of that in case of federation, uh, I think those challenges basically are, are, are being multiplied. So if we are saying about the volume, uh, so I think uh, uh, so we are describing the, the described amount of uh, data coming in, and uh, I think that uh, only this is one good reason for federation. So to increase total volume. Uh, so to have different data providers in federation. So, um, the, uh, so what are the needs here is the technical integration. So, so there is a need for data management system and there are, there is a need for tools to facilitate integration and, uh, the data staging, the data management system into kind of analysis, uh, workflows. So, um, uh, here, uh, uh, the EU has for data have uh, some initial proposition of such uh, uh, data management uh, with uh, uh, here uh, the connectors, uh, data bro broker, um, and also the uh, metadata uh, broker. So there is some initial design of the of the architecture that that project provides. If we say about uh, variety, so I think this this has been already uh, uh, mentioned. In, uh, on previous uh, uh, talks, uh, but I think uh, it will be even more uh, in detail mentioned in the next talk by, by Paola. So, um, uh, in general, uh, for the variety, uh, we have to take into account the different uh, uh, data that are structured, semi-structured, and un unstructured, and, and this this is in particular challenging in the federation of different types of providers, uh, even not uh, only different providers, but even types of providers. I would say. So um, uh, we have many existing uh, metadata schemes, standards. Uh, uh, so so you really need a, a kind of harmonization engine that uh, was already also mentioned. That is some some of the things that uh, the project works on, and there is a need for automatic classification tools based on uh, populated and standardized ontologies. And basically, uh, the project is planning to use of IDS uh, ontology and also an interoperability uh, semantic layer uh, service will be generated. Uh, so, in in project itself, uh, th there was some initial analysis of I think over one hundred twenty five data uh, sources of the data sets and. Uh, um, uh, basically, these are different, the open, closed, uh, I mean, industrial, uh, there was research data, um, uh, each were different, on many, there were many types of data, license, formats, and uh, different standards, uh, uh, relevant, vacularis, uh, uh, currently available to describe this metadata, right? So, and, and, we also, not all the data sets and the uh, source provided the RDF is a metadata file, but I think this uh, this will be more discussed in, in the next next talk. So I will move uh, further. So about the velocity, so we are thinking about the speed which data is processed, and I think this is uh, this is one of the uh, aspects that is really not easy. Uh, uh, to, to to tackle, I think, uh, in general, in federation. So um, there are several projects and research uh, in this area. Uh, they are focusing on aspects like the network connectivity I/O, and and I think the benefit of the federation this aspect is uh, you know the federation through its catalogs, uh, through its um, uh, different kind of broker and services can find. Uh, what can do uh, in practical at, at this moment, I think, can ha uh, help finding resources of ap appropriate parameters for uh, in, in terms of uh, of uh, uh, I/O or, or other other um, uh, things uh, that, that you need for achieving appropriate speed. If we move to veracity, and that's one of the challenge I would like to extend a bit more. Uh, uh, one of those the aspects important are data provenance aspects, and I think this this goes in line uh, with what just was in the previous talk on, on the data management plan, where we were speaking about uh, uh, 
the life cycle, uh, research data life cycle. Uh, so uh, basically data provenance, uh, uh, it, it is about detecting the origin, the creation, propagation process of the data. And it, it's about the lineage uh, of the data and data objects. And, and uh, usually you, what you have attached with such, uh, uh, in such case, you, you have the uh, metadata uh, additional uh, related to execution environment uh, uh, that, that happened during processing, during the transformation. So um, why we need at all data provenance, why this is important? Because uh, basically the, the really faulty or um, uh, wrong database or, or on purpose or not could lead to really incorrect uh, results or, or could lead to, uh, to some, uh, uh, even ca some catastrophic situation, I would say. So um, also please remember that data quality might change over time. And, and um, so um, provenance itself can be used for uh, different purposes like uh, query reproduction, uh, the data uh, quality management, fault tolerance. And there are several other advantages like reusability, reproducibility, so about, uh, well, very important on the ownership, uh, 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 copyright, but also on, on the security, right? And this is very important for estimating the level of uh, um, quality and trust of data. I think that's that's very important aspect. So there are several general challenges with data provenance in general, and not even getting into, uh, uh, let's say, big data area and federation. Uh, so we are thinking about um, transformation data sources into different data formats. We are saying about the efficiency of, uh, of uh, uh, collecting provenance uh, uh, data, and and uh, uh, we really need to 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 uh, uh, to capture inside the provenance uh, so different actions in which uh, have been performed. So if we go into uh, big data applications, uh, so 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 uh, we could uh, see this look at it at, at, at as a veracity. So how accurate or truthful our data set? And um, um, so the point is, it's very hard to reproduce in general execution from provenance for big data applications. So many of the systems just uh, record intermediate data generated during uh, the, the executions. Uh, um, and, and also, if you go to federation or if you go to distributed resources, this is even more uh, difficult with high volume or high velocity data and, and tracking this. Uh, in, in more centralized uh, fashion is very inefficient and this is also uh, very difficult to store to distribute provenance because often it's, it's safe on, on, on very distributed and non-permanent nodes. So what I would say is, is that's I think some of the future challenge that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, you, you have for data is uh, is, uh, is is or will provide some some initial building block, and, and I think some good starting point in the federation is this EDSA reference uh, architecture. Uh, um, so so I think that's that's one one of the step uh, um, forward. But uh, those challenges related to data provenance, I think that's that's something for maybe even future projects. So uh, thank you very much. That's it for my set. I will be happy to respond to any question. Thank you very much, Martin. It was really interesting, this um, anticipation of the challenges that we are going, we will have to solve, we will have to solve in, in the next, um, in the next couple of years. And yes, if you have questions for Martin, for other speakers, please use um, dedicated Q&A box and we'll take all the questions for us. If we have time, we can take as many questions as we can at the end of our session. And now I'm very happy to um, introduce our next speaker and it's Paula Peña from DIH Aragon. And Paula, the floor, the microphone, the screen are yours. Yes, let me, uh, thanks for the interaction. Natalie, I'm, let me to share the screen. Yes, 
Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm Paula Peña from Technological Institute of Aragon, and I'm going to present the data harmonization and standardization technical challenge. I will concentrate on the following points. First of all, I'll introduce aspects about the importance of the harmonization of of data in the big data era. Then I'll present the EU has for data project contents and the technical challenge that we have to face. And after that, I'll describe the approach uh, being following in the project. And finally, I'll summarize the main conclusions. Well, uh, it's obvious that the progress is emerging uh, emerging of significant technological changes has been the driver for the large amount of data generated and accumulated and due to the evolution of the big data era and its new characteristic data has become the main asset and the most powerful enabled for any organization. And as a result, the world is overflowing with the unstructured data. And in this context appear the key word of metadata. Metadata gain importance because uh, or gain importance in finding relevant and reliable information. In addition, it helps to make sense of the large amount of information and data. But what is a metadata? As you probably know, metadata can be informally defined as data about data, and that is any kind of information that in some way uh, reference or describes aspect of some other piece of the information. However, sometimes the importance of metadata is underestimated and nowadays there is a lack of metadata and it leads to, to difficulties in comparing data and data sets. And harmonization metadata is one way to make information easy to access and understand. But what does it mean? Metadata harmonization is the ability of two or more systems or components to exchange combined metadata conforming to two or more metadata specification and to interpret the metadata that has been exchanged in a way that is consistent with the intention of the creator of the metadata. Of, co of course, metadata harmonization has a lot of benefits such as a better data quality and interoperability, provide coherent outputs, uh, faster speed to insights, gain for the user of statistics, and so on. Nowadays, metadata uh, specifications suffer from a huge lack of harmonization. And in addition, we have taken it into account that metadata interoperability is a key point in the specification and system. So, uh, harmonization and standardization of data is a big challenge. But what happened with EUHAS for Data uh, project? Uh, in order to bring data-driven innovation closer to the industry, uh, the role of competence uh, centers and digital innovation hubs is crucial. With this project, we want to break silos and find synergies and foster collaboration among digital innovation hubs in different technologies uh, regarding big data domain. So, identification and the analysis of data sources and data sets are required. In the UHAS for Data ecosystem, the resources require data sources and data sets are very extensive and they can come from different application domains such as industry, personal, uh, public or private repositories, uh, governmental, uh, governmental projects and so on. And also these data sets came from in a variety of formats and types and licenses. And moreover, the data sets are described with different schemes or, or metadata. And sometimes we have found that these uh, data sets have poor metadata. So with the aim of offering a catalog of federated da data-driven services that aggregate individual offers, the harmonization of metadata becomes the main and most powerful enable for facilitating their integration and the exploitation in the services offering in the federated catalog. But in order to obtain this harmonization, what is missing in this uh, project and uh, at this moment? We need a semantic layer that enable better harmonization between this metadata, but also allow us to enrich the data set with additional information. 
So our approach is focusing the use of semantic technologies that uh, have gained importance in order to represent data sources and metadata. And also the concept of ontology has attracted increased attention because of its ability to achieve a representation of, of the shared knowledge. And uh, ontology is uh, an important point in order to create and use of data exchange standards uh, as well to, to solve problems regarding heterogeneity and poor uh, interoperability. For this reason, the use of an ontology is proposed with the aim of achieving integration between data, metadata and knowledge, and also to contribute to better interoperability. But how to reach this objective? Uh, there are several steps involved. Uh, first of all, we had to analyze in detail uh, metadata using data set identified in the project. We had to review the, the state of art uh, of standards and relevant vocabularies available to describe metadata. We had to, uh, to decide if selecting or building a metadata model or ontology in order to offer a unique view of metadata and offer more or an extra information. And for next step, uh, we will have to structure the application domain data based on the model selected and catalog and classify data sources and data set with the metadata and reads. Regarding to select or build a metadata or ontology model, finally, in the harmonization challenge in this project, we decided to base on the international data that space ontology. Why? Because the, this model uh, defined uh, concept displayed in this illustration, and not only include information about data, but also to include data ownership information, general use uh, condition, prices for data use, information about where and how the data can be accessed. And um, also, uh, this model reduces external uh, schemes or ontology, such as DCAT, SQOS, uh, organization and all time uh, ontologies, and uh, it promotes a, a, a standard for a data space. And with this ontology, ontology uh, we have to try to, to map or to matching this uh, the metadata of this data set with the IDS ontology. And an interoperability semantic layer service uh, will be generated. And this is the, with or through an API, the latest version, version of the whole dataset catalog will be requested. And with the appropriate metadata, the service will be mapped or, or correlate uh, the IDS ontology model. And in this process, uh, we are working on semi-automatic semantic map mapping with the help of lexical database like uh, WordNet and others. And also different techniques and models uh, are being used in order to analyze this automatically and get insights in order to improve data set, its access and use. And all uh, this uh, all will allow to gain a richer representation of the domain. As a result, uh, the metadata enriched and additional information discovered between data set will be displayed in the, uh, the latest version of the catalog in the website of the project. And to sum up, uh, to say that how to provide an harmonization and a standardization of metadata become a critical issue and a hot topic. And with the artificial intelligence technology, technology such as semantic technology, uh, helps to address the issue of harmonization and standardization uh, challenge. And these technologies are key to deliver services and data in a standardized way. And that's all. Um, thanks for your attention. And I'm available for any question later. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for, for this presentation. A fascinating presentation about importance of metadata and actually how difficult it is to harmonize and standardize it and how important it is for for many, uh, for many sectors, for many industries, for any 
many um, companies, but for our project, it's vital. And now we are moving to the next challenge, next set of challenges, and I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Jordi Arjona Roca from ITI in Valencia. Please, Jordi, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I assume that you see my screen already. <laughs> Let me just minimize these Zoom things. Okay, so um, hello, everyone, again. My name is, is Jordi Arjona. I work on, at ITI as coordinator of the of the distributed systems research line and today i want to introduce you to two challenges that will uh, have to be faced for the creation of a european federation of the ahs although that can as well uh, be extended to other similar initiatives like gaia x or OMG, right? uh, the challenges are the uh, inter catalog synchronization and the payment and billing policies so let's start with the um, with first one, uh, which is the intercatalog synchronization. I'm gonna start by providing some some context. So let's assume that we have four different organizations, okay, organizations or ecosystems or or in this case the IHS. These DIHs have have members or customers that might be uh, quite different among themselves. And these members may wish to, sorry, these DIHs uh, uh, offer different services to, to their members. And at the same time, these members may wish to offer different, different services or data sets or other things like consultancy or analysis uh, to other members in that ecosystem. Uh, at the end of the day, these services are registered in a catalog and this catalog is offered to the local ecosystem as a point of access to these services that either the, the, the main node in the, in the DIH or, or any of the members of the DIH are offering to the ecosystem itself. Now, well, we say that we want to move into a federation of DIHs. That that means that we will not have our local catalog anymore. We will need a global catalog that is the union or a partial aggregation of the, the previous local catalogs that we were talking about. Um, okay, so this catalog will have to include uh, the different catalogs, or I will say, all, maybe not all the catalogs, but part of the catalogs, at least of each one of these, of these nodes that we have previously in the um, in the federation and we'll have or we require the dihs uh, whatever kind of nodes we have to synchronize any change or any update or any removal or addition that they make on this catalog okay well one option is to have a, a central catalog as as display right basically all the nodes are sending their information their things to the to a, to a central location where this catalog is stored and is being offered to the rest of the world, to the rest of the world and to the members of the different ecosystems in the Federation. Um, okay, but this has pros and this has cons. As pros, well, it is a single deployment and can be easier to maintain, but it is also a single point of error. Uh, this means that if for whatever reason, uh, the node or the nodes hosting the catalog are not available, um, it cannot be accessed and the services cannot be consumed by anyone in the Federation, for instance, right? It might also lead to a complex or a, or a more fine-grained authorization scheme because basically if everyone has to access to the same catalog to, to make their changes, additions, upgrades, whatever, that means that we have to somehow limit very well what's the scope that can be modified by each one of the members in the Federation because I can modify whatever is related to my services, no, but not whatever is uh, related to the, to the services of Ricardo or of Natalie or any other one in the Federation, right? <clears throat> Sorry. Alternatively, it may be more complex for a DAH to introduce content in the catalog, because if we opt uh, to not have this complex authorization scheme, basically we need a man in the middle that is receiving the request for the, from the members and updating this in the catalog which is not very flexible at least, right? This, or, or, or the, reduces the, autonom the, the autonomy of the DAHs. And finally, if there is a set of services that are to be offered only locally, 
because I might want to offer services to the Federation, but for whatever reason, I might not want to offer all my services to the Federation, but some of them only to the local ecosystem. That I will, I mean, so then I will need a, another or a different tool to, to show these services, right? Because it's a global catalog. Everyone is gonna see them and everyone could request them, right? So, okay, one alternative then is to distribute the catalog. Okay, distribute the catalog and have it synchronized. So basically this gives more power and autonomy to the local DIHs because it's gonna allow to have control over their content in the catalog. Basically, I'm gonna be interacting with my local copy of the catalog and, and whatever change I, I do on, on my local co uh, copy of the catalog uh, will be then propagated to the, to the rest of the members. Uh, it allows me, allows me to make a filtering on what services from the Federation I want to offer in my local ecosystem. Because for instance, I might be offering uh, a service that is the same service that Ricardo is offering or that Marcin is offering. And because I don't want any competence on my service, I'm gonna be filtering them out, for instance, right? Whatever reason. And also uh, at the same time, allows me to use the same tool for my services that I only want to show in my local ecosystem and also for the service that I'm sharing to the, to the Federation. Because I have my local uh, copy of the catalog and from there I will extract a local view that is what I'm gonna show in my, in my, I don't know, in my portal, in my web or my whatever, right? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, as well, the system is gonna be more resilient and there is not going to be a single point of error. Um, because one thing I'm forgetting to mention is that having a system like this is not uh, opposite to still having a central catalog that will not be or will, doesn't have to be seen as a central location uh, that everyone is depending on it. It's just another node that is going to be showing everything in the Federation. So if for whatever reason my node falls, uh, first the other DIHs still have their catalog and can give service to, to their ecosystem. And even in my ecosystem, they will be able to access the, this central catalog if mine is down for any reason, right? <clears throat> of course, most of these things I'm mentioning are, are pros, but this comes with a cost, right? The, the cost in this, in this case uh, is having to have and having to maintain a local deployment. Uh, it's not nothing incredibly complex, but well, you have to maintain your, your local copy of the catalog. And you also need to have a, a, a mechanism for the synchronization. I mean, something uh, based on Kafka or in M or on MQTT or on, on NATS, for instance, right? Uh, that will allow for this synchronization or for the communication of the changes across the, the different members of, of the Federation. Okay, here you have just a, a brief summary of, of some of the things I have been mentioning as pros and cons of the centralized and decentralized approach. I, I, I vote for the decentralized approach. Everyone knows that <laughs> in has for data and I'm a, a defensor of it. But we're uh, still having, uh, we still have to make some decisions and soon we will decide with the, what, what is the approach we finally opt for in the, in the plan. Okay, let's move now to the, to, the second, to the second challenge, okay? Which are the payment and billing policies. I mean, what do we refer uh, to with this uh, payment and, and billing policies? Well, the keyword here is harmonization and that is not usually something simple. I mean, say that, for instance, we have two DIHs, two or 20 at the end of the day is, is the same, right? And these DIHs offer different computing resources, data set services, their own developed services, other things like analytics or consultancy, whatever, right? Okay, we, have, we can have our user going and inspecting what are the services that are being offered by node A. And he will find a very well precise, well defined, concrete set of, of billing policies, right? I, mean, I don't know, I'm going to pay this amount of euros per core or per gigabyte of RAM or per day, this amount of euros per terabyte of data of, for the data sets, whatever. Just a well defined policy. And then it's, let's check what is the other DIH offering. And well, he can go and find a very well nice defined uh, 
set of billing policies. That the only problem is that they are completely different to what the other DIH is, is using. I mean, the billing policies or the billing criteria are totally different. Okay, we believe that this is something that should not happen, right? Prices might not, prices will, will not be the same in different DIHs for the simple reason that we are in different countries and the different cost of life, whatever. But one thing is the price, another thing is the billing policy, right? I mean, we should all try to unify the way we are billing our customers. And this applies as well to, to compensation policies, yes, right? Thinking on services that were not performing correctly, or if there is a cancellation of a service that was booked, whatever. The goal here, or, or the thing that we should have in mind is, let's make life simple for our customers, right? Or for our users or members. A different issue, on the other hand, <clears throat> is when we have uh, or when a user can request a, a, service to, uh, sorry, a service to its local DIH, but this service belongs to another DIH, right? Something more or less like this. So in this case, if the solution is redirecting the user to the other DIH, then we're done. Everything is fine because the, the user will ask the other DIH, will pay to the, DIH, to the other DIH, and that's it. Life is easy and beautiful. Uh, however, a different issue comes when, when the user can, can request the service, the service to the other DIH and that service is going to be deployed in its local DIH, right? Uh, then there are things that we have to agree on beforehand. First thing is who the user has to pay to, to the DIH that is hosting the service or to the DIH that is offering the service. And if the case is that part of the payment is going to go to one DIH, the one deploying the service, and part of the uh, payment is going to be going to the second DIH, the second, the, the one that is um, offering the service, in, and this payment is because, uh, or because of a loyalty or because of a, a property, whatever, then, uh, well, this is something that be, before than anything, has to be clearly stipulated or described in the service description. So, so DIHs know what happened when they offer the service of a third party. Uh, this has to be agreed. Uh, there have to be there has to be a clear mechanism to ex exchange uh, payments between between DIHs because it might happen that I mean the customer is gonna make the payment to one of them, and if then that DIH has to make a payment to the other one. Uh, we need to know how this payment is going to be. So everyone, I mean, there's nothing is strange happening, basically. Or if um, at the end of the day or at the end of the month, node A has to pay 3,000 euros to node B, and node B has to pay 5,000 euros to, to node A. So maybe it's easier to just make a 2,000 euros transfer, and that's it. But all these things are policies that have to be uh, manage, define, work out from the governance point of view of the federation. So these are challenges that we are going to have there that we will have to agree on and that we are all going to have to tackle and assume at some point uh, of the life of the project on the one hand and of the life of the federation in the other hand whenever uh, it is fully operative. Right? operative. And, and well, again, this is just a, a brief summary of some of the points I was dropping in the previous slide. And that's all from my side. Uh, thanks a lot. And if you have any question, just feel free to drop it and we will do our best to try to answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, very interesting presentation about, about the challenges, not only related to data sets, but obviously data services. This project is both data sets and data services. And uh, as, as you said, there are lots of things we are facing and there are lots of things we will need to decide upon right now. We are running a bit, a bit short of time, so um, I will give the floor to Andrea Manse once again to speak about the lessons learned and then perhaps we will conclude. Okay, thanks a lot, Natalie. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I have only three slides, you know, to describe a little bit the uh, lesson learned next steps. Uh, for the, also given that we are like uh, running late. So first of all, uh, one of the things that we learned initially immediately on the project is that uh, what we have, 
what we have planned uh, for the initial interoperability between the services uh, that uh, you know planning initially uh, that was planned initially to be ready by the first uh, open call after uh, uh, nine months of the project was not possible to achieve. Uh, we underestimated, of course, the uh, learning core of the IDS, uh, you know, architecture model and the connector, and uh, therefore, you know, it was impossible to to set up connectors before the open call. And for this, you know, we have uh, created a working group to work around uh, these uh, particular issues uh, and to work together, you know, and to collaborate between the different uh, DIHs uh, in order to implement. Uh, IDS Connect set up or uh, implement IDS Connector for the particular uh, uh, interoperability to be uh, put in place for the for the during the the open calls uh, of the project. Um, another points that I want to um, that we have learned is that of course uh, the project um, everything all the activities are for the project, but the long term of the, our project is building the federation. So uh, any activity, any technical activities and uh, decision that affect uh, the future federation will be then um, uh, discussed with a technical committee that is going to be uh, created uh, uh, in the project and agreeing on all this uh, long-term technical decision that will affect also the, the future the federation. And also the fact that uh, we, have, um, we have to uh, use the open calls that uh, and experiments that are uh, have been selected during the open calls and uh, feedback in order to improve and iterate uh, the, uh, the the catalog uh, uh, and uh, you know our offer um so then i would just mention what are the priorities of the upcoming months so first of all uh, as i mentioned before uh, continue the uh, they work around the IDS and perform, uh, you know, the the to have this level of interoperability for the technical services that are used by the experiments during the field school. We will have uh, 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 to integrate uh, the assets coming from uh, the new DIHs that uh, will join the federation in October 2021. And uh, uh, another points, uh, you know, all the running experiments uh, during this period that will produce, as I said, the uh, outputs and also they will bring outputs. And this is something that, of course, we will work on integrating into the catalog. And then we'll, we need to be ready also for the next open call that is planned for the, the end of the year. And uh, of course, we need to update the catalog for this. And uh, in this case, we will also include the training catalog, which is under uh, building. And uh, just a final slide saying, you know, that of course we plan to deliver the final version of the federated catalog implementation uh, before the end of the 2021, when the last project open call will uh, will uh, uh, will run. And uh, of course we will aim of the boarding the assets of the new DIH is the experiments, uh, facilitating you know the boarding phase, and of course. The operation of the future federation as a single entity and with the final aim of course of contributing to the creation of the european common data spaces and uh, yes this was the my final uh, you know part of the of the session thanks a lot thanks a lot andrea about this um con this uh, summary this recap and also what is in store for us in the next in the next uh, uh, few months, uh, few months, months and also years of the project. So we are running very short on time. In fact, we are running over time. So I will take maybe one or two questions. I'll just double check what we have. Um, we have some question about um, the topic of distributed catalog data. And I will read the question and then perhaps the speakers who were talking more about the data set can, can take it. So on the topic of distributed catalog data in charging for service, this depends on complementary capabilities such as subscription, notification, and resource usage tracking. I think uh, that's, uh, your, 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 that's for you. Standardization is important in multi-party ecosystem. It might be worth looking into one M2M standard that specifies such common services in the context of sharing IoT data. Right. So, um, anyone wants to comment on on this on this um, on this question that also is uh, posted in the. I actually think that there were like two different things in there, right? Yeah. I mean, 
Okay, so let's start the first about uh, usage tracking and billing. I think your it's for you. Uh, well, usage tracking, it's something that we didn't mention today, but the, the, we will need to have a traceability mechanisms, okay? So basically know what a user is consume, well, requesting for, what is what the DIH agreed with the user to concede, concede, in, concede no, sorry, to offer. Uh, so basically we know exactly what the user is consuming and for how long uh, the user is consuming this service. Uh, this, when we're talking about uh, computing or computational services, because there may be other services like consultancy or, or data analytics, uh, consulting as well, that are different, right? That, is, that will be checked for hours or something like that. Uh, of course, when we have this uh, telemetry or, or this traceability that allow us to know what the user is doing and consuming, then we can check it, of course. Uh, it's required to have this mechanism in order to do a proper charging. Um, but it's still, uh, I mean, that is really to, to what we were saying that in addition to have this telemetry or these ways of, of metering the consumption of the user, the, the billing has to be uniform. So I, I think I think is one thing is a requirement for the other. I think I, I reply the I address the, the, the question. If not, please just uh, state it in the chat. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so the second question um, is about standardization, uh, which is important in multi-party ecosystems. It might be worth looking into the one M2M standard that specifies such common services in the content of sharing of IoT data. So um, this is not actually a question. I think this is a suggestion. If anyone wants to comment or on this suggestion, please go ahead. If, yes, Paola, Ricardo. Yeah, no, I totally agree with this. If we if we go more with um, the sort of static data, uh, there are different you know kind of approaches right to sharing. But when we bring you know the sort of IoT data, particularly if it's you know dynamic, you know we are dealing with the streams. We have to worry you know the standards, the protocol, and how to actually you know deal with the sharing of that data. It's a different universe. And in EU has for data, we are trying to do the static and the stream kind of IoT data. So we are we are we're looking at that. So that that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe all my speakers, please um, show your, your faces once again. We're going to thank you all uh, for this session. Um, it's, you know, I've worked, I've been working with you for now nine, nine months, right? And I learned personally quite a lot from, from your presentation. Um, I think um, the session has been recorded and so the information and details will be available on, on the website and obviously all the speakers if you want to get in touch with them and uh, ask them follow-up questions or find out what we are doing more in, in depth in this project you're always to to follow our news on the project website or other social social media thanks again everyone who attended this session uh, once again, thanks uh, my, the speakers. It was really a pleasure doing this session with you. And um, uh, we are going to continue with Data Week. There are many, many fascinating sessions um, uh, tomorrow. So uh, log in and attend. Thank you. Bye-bye.